discuss um, colloids in liquid crystals. Uh, and uh, um, so uh, uh, I uh, had a chance to discuss already the cases where we have uh, colloidal particles coupled to uh, topologically non-trivial field configurations such as hopions and torrents. Um, and uh, we discussed last time that uh, um, the particles can have different charge uh, that they introduce to the liquid crystal depending on the field configuration of the vector on the surface of the particles. Right? And so then we introduced different techniques for fabrication of colloidal particles of uh, topologically non trivial shapes. Right, so this uh, one of those techniques was uh, uh, two photon water polymerization that allows us to <coughs> polymerize particles of complex shapes. Um, and then uh, uh, today I would like to discuss particles that have topology of surfaces different from that of spheres. Right, so um, as we already uh, discussed last time, even a particle this as complex shape as the spiral you can see here is still homeomorphic to um, a colloidal sphere. Right? The surface can be still continuously deformed to sphere. And therefore the topological defects that we were obtaining in this case were still also homeomorphic to those you typically observe around spheres like such a ring in here. Um, and so uh, now let's see what happens if we uh, introduce particles with different topologies. So, for example, in here we have a colloidal particle with five holes. That means the genus of this surface of the particle is five. The boundary conditions of the particle surface are perpendicular. And so we can see that uh, we do induce topological defects, both point defects and ring shaped discriminations. As we introduce this particle, observed here between cross polarizers, with and without the relation plates, and in here um, just in a microscope without polarizers. <coughs> and then we can do three dimensional imaging of the director field around those colloidal particles using techniques we discussed in details during the first lecture. So here is uh, um, three photon. Um, uh, excitation um, fluorescent polarizing microscopy images where we have both in plane cross sections obtained for two mutual orthogonal polarizations labeled by <coughs> two arrows, right? So we first acquire polarized fluorescence images um, uh, obtained using multi photon excitations for two polarizations of excitation line, and then we overlay them, superimpose on top of each other while labeling fluorescence intensity signals with different colors corresponding to the colors of those two ref, um, uh, arrows we use for labeling polarization. And so uh, then we can also obtain all kinds of vertical cross sections of the samples and from images, those are just examples, right? We need a lot more in order to understand what's going on um, for different polarizations and different cross-sections. But from those types of images, we can reconstruct what really happens with director field as we introduce those perpendicular boundary conditions uh, in um, the sample with uniform far field allowing to liquid crystal director, but with such a colloidal particle that has complex topology of surface. And so here we have particle with genus 1, genus 2, genus 3, 4, and 5. Um, and so we can study in details the defects in all of those cases as a function of genus of the surface. Um, and here you can see examples of field configurations that we get. It is important to point out that there are multiple stable and metastable field configurations that can exist. Right? So for example, um, in the case of single rings, right, when we have genus um, G equal 1, 
we can have in the very center either point defect or ring shape discrimination <coughs> loop. Um, and uh, those are topologically equivalent to each other. The actual charge in both cases is the same, right? But both configurations can exist, as you can see in the sample, very same sample for two things <coughs> next to each other, right? So you can actually use laser physics to switch and go from one to the other configuration reversibly. Right now, um, also you can note that when we have a particle like this one, this genus G equals 3, in the very same particle, in some holes we could have point defects, in some holes we could have ring shape defects, right? And so this picture is depicted in here, right? One is ring shape discrimination loop to point defects, just like in this example. So you can see that. Um, multiple possibilities arise in terms of satisfying topological constraints. This can be done through uh, generation of point defects or through generation of ring shape disconnection loops. Um, but uh, 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 the, the number of possible configurations increases even further as we go to particles with higher genus, like phi and p. Right? Now, uh, uh, yes? Um, you, you said a minute ago that you can go from one kind of defect structure to another reversibly with laser tweezers. But how, how do you know what to do with the laser tweezers if you want to go one way or the other? Do you just heat, heat it up and then randomly get one or the other, or do you actually have a plan? It's, it's a plan. It takes some deliberate tweaking, right, um, of the laser beam that. Um, uh, you know, then uh, would either uh, preferentiate one of the other structure, right? So you, you can note in here that in this one, in the very center, you have most of the homotropic texture, right? But then in here, you have more of the planar texture. So if you shine laser beam and induce a little bit of inkling component, then you switch one to the other and vice versa. So. Uh, it is not really, um, uh, you know, something very complicated to do. Having a laser that you can very easily focus and manipulate, you know, uh, lets you to go back and forth very easily. It's more difficult to explain than to do. <laughs> you had a question too. Yeah, I was just wondering if the even or oddness of the genus has any effect. Because here, all the even ones have really uh -huh. um, well, you yeah, see here is just one genus equal oh, one, but, but you have both configurations. Uh, it's, um, we, we did not see any statistical significance in observations of, uh, you know, of, uh, there was no correlations that we could see from experiments. Um, yeah, well, in a sense, uh, those defects do not necessarily know that much about what others are doing. Right, so just because, as I mentioned, you can switch very easily from one configuration to the other by laser beams, as you would, for example, have those samples in the initial quench from isotropic state, you know, um, you could end up with multiple different configurations, right? It's just like in the examples, um, the Keeble mechanism that Mark was discussing for, you know, the quench of isotropic phase to pneumatic phase, right? And then you can have, with certain probability, you know, defects form or not. Um, in here, different types of defects could form with certain probability depending on how little domains quench, um, you know, nucleate and then field boundary conditions, you know. Uh, depending how exactly this happens, you could end up with multiple configurations, right? These point defects or ring shape defects, right? So, um, um, but the, the key thing is that we can, you know, use tweezers and also, as you will see in just a minute, apply external fields and control what we really see. Um, so, uh, now, what's interesting is that when you have those kinds of non-spherical particles, 
you can also switch the orientations. Mm -hmm. And what we note is that we can also obtain um, multiple stable or metastable orientational states for such particles. So in here, for example, is a planar cell where far field director is marked with this double arrow, and you know that the original state we have is a ring which is perpendicular to the plane of the image here and the liquid crystal cell. Um, and so you see, you look at it edge on right now, but as we would apply voltage, typical voltage we usually apply to liquid crystals like 5 CB to switch them, so here is 2.5 volts, you realign liquid crystal director to be more or less perpendicular to the substance of cell in majority of the cell thickness, right, across the cell. And so then the ring orient orients, keeps its orientation perpendicular to far field director, right, and it now becomes in plane. Do you see what happens? So we could realign with the crystal director, and with that, we realign also ring because it's mechanically coupled through the director structure that we generate, director structure of this type, right? But <clears throat> what's more interesting that um, we can turn off field and the relaxation of director distortions, depending on how exactly we do that, can be such that the ring-shaped particle will remain to be parallel to the plane of the cell, right? But you can see that the director structure changed, right? Um, to accommodate the fact that now, um, at no voltage, director is, is in plane as it used to be here. Okay, so, uh, uh, so now the reconstructed field configuration is the one you can see in here. And so one discrimination loop is in the central plane parallel to the plane of the ring-shaped particle itself. The other one, um, you can see, is making this complex configuration which is ring-shaped, but uh, in parts of the uh, sample it's kind of following edges of, of the particle and then making the ring like this, right? So again, we will see that uh, it satisfies all topological constraints, but uh, we can do it in so many ways, right? So here we satisfy those constraints by having particles aligned with the plane perpendicular to the far field director, right? In all of those cases in homotropic liquid crystal cells, right? Uh, here we can see that it's possible to do also having particle parallel with this with its uh, plane parallel to the far field director, just we end up having somewhat different defect configurations in this case. And what's important is that those particles, you know, can be switched from one orientation to the other orientation by applying voltages as low as 2.5 volts, right? And you can have them long-term stable in those by stable orientational states with different different configurations. So again, Robin probably will think, start thinking about device applications. <laughs> Maybe she will have some advice on, um, on who could be interested in this type of technology. But indeed, you know, having colloidal inclusions that can be in different stable configurations could be attractive for some applications because it does not have to be particles made from silica or polymer, you could also have them made from gold or silver or, you know, of, uh, semiconductor materials. So, you know, those could be, uh, you know, manufactured to have some functionality as well. All right, now, so here we switch between two states, but um, uh, I also want to demonstrate to you that we can continuously rotate those particles as well. But just like we rotate um, the director field in the middle plane of the cell by changing voltage, uh, you can see here that the uh, in-plane projection of the particle changes as we change applied voltage to the crystal cell. 
and then we can obtain vertical cross-sections along this line and so you can see cross-sections of the particle uh, which is tilting uh, and this tilt handle which is plotted in here as a function of voltage can be continuously changed too right? so uh, now all we do is liquid crystals in terms of designing them, them for applications can be also done with uh, the particles, uh, anisotropic particles like those in here, uh, that respond to uh, low voltage of applied fields as well. And so this obviously does not make much sense to do when you have spherical colloids, but when you have uh, uh, colloids with more complicated geometries like ring shaped particles, in here this is possible to do. So here are a couple more examples. Uh, of similar stuff done also uh, not just for uh, genus 1 particle but genus 2 particle as well so you can see both of them can be parallel to the far field director and, he is, and here is yet different configuration where the particle plane is parallel to far field director but we instead have two point defects not uh, two ring defects as in the case before and so here is again more point defects, uh, even when such a particle with two rings is parallel to the far field director. So again, you, you see a diversity of structures and points versus line defects. You can see you know, lots of combinations are possible, but what about topology? Um, you know, if we were now to look carefully at what the director field does around all of those point and ring shape defects um, and then map those field configurations to the order parameter space and find out what topological charges they carry we realize that in all cases I discussed, right, we do satisfy the topological theorems um, and so indeed in all of those cases we have those defect charges the hedgehog charges adding to uh, the order characteristic divided by two remember those are here bulk charges this relation has to hold where chi has the same definition as we saw already many times right and so what this means is by controlling the surface Partic uh, topology of particle surfaces, we can control the bulk defects that we induce in liquid crystals. Right? It's important because um, because we can design the particles with desired genus, desired oil characteristic, and um, this allows us to induce the defects that we want. But we also should keep in mind that. Um, in the case of liquid crystals, there are multiple ways of satisfying uh, the, the topological constraints. Right? You can see we can do it through uh, generating ring-shaped distillation loops of many different types and also point defects and combinations of those. Um, now, uh, uh, let us now take a look at what happens if instead of perpendicular boundary conditions, we have tangential surface anchoring on the particle surfaces. So in this case, you see the ring shaped particles induce uh, the surface point defects, the so-called bujums. And so uh, when we have ring shaped particle like this, um, uh, the uh, tip most typical, most common configuration is that with four bujums. Right? But you remember probably that genus equal zero means all the characteristic is uh, equal one, it means all the characteristic is zero. Um, and so in principle you don't have to have those bujums, right? Because um, the net uh, charge of defects that you would induce on the surface of the torus should be equal to zero, right? And so, uh, indeed, by doing three-dimensional imaging, polarizing microscopy, and three-photon fluorescence, polarizing microscopy for different polarizations and cross-sections, we can uncover the structure 
of uh, induced field configurations and defects. And we know that indeed, uh, in terms of the um, two-dimensional charges that the director field at the interface of particle and the um, liquid crystal has, we have those, those charges self-compensating each other. Right? Because we have um, the 2 minus 1 and 2 plus 1 uh, bujums or surface point defects in this case, self-compensating for each other. So this is important. We do, uh, you know, satisfy the topological constraints, and this is also the case when we go from genus one to say genus two particle surface. So in here you can see experimental images. In this case, with one, two, three, four, five, six bujums, right? And uh, those very same bujums can be noted in uh, computer simulations, which are done by minimizing the landau um free energy. Um, and uh, um, um, these also uh, additional surface sampling terms. Uh, and so as we do it, um, we then again can characterize what are the charges um, of the bujums or quantity numbers of bujums, and we again can see that they add to all the characteristics as we would expect. Um, and so here is uh, a little table that we construct for particles with different genus. We have G equals 3, 4, and 5 in those examples I demonstrate. And again, you can see that um, as we count charges, uh, and add all the winding numbers, um, they add to chi, right? So here is genus chi, and uh, the number of plus one and minus one hedgehogs is adding to this number. But you can see that just like in the case of genus equal one particle, we have extra defects that are not required by topology, but they are appearing to minimize free energy, right? So adding extra defects sometimes helps to minimize energy, right? And uh, because we can relieve some of the band play distortions that otherwise would be more costly if you were to not to have those defects. Ivan? Yes? yes? Are you sure they're not meant stable? Did you demonstrate that the extra defects really lower the energy from the simulation? Yes. Um, and. Um, um, uh, so we can, and I don't demonstrate it here, but with laser tweezers we can move them around uh, and uh, sometimes we can cause annihilation. Uh, so in that case, um, you know, we know those were metastable, right? Uh, now uh, in, in uh, our manuscript we also compared, so for example, I, I don't discuss all possible configurations, but for genus equal one state, it is possible to obtain configuration without bujums. Uh, in this case, the particle would be perpendicular to far field director, and you would just have um, twist distortions that would be matching the tangential anchoring on the surface. And so we calculated free energies for the two cases, and the one with four bujums is lower in free energy while the one without defects is high in free energy. Um, but uh, uh, this is consistent with experiments because the one with four bujums is by far much more frequently observed. The one without bujums at all is observed relatively rarely, maybe in 5% of cases. Right? So, um, uh, so defects, additional defects typically help to lower free energy. And, uh, we can uh, provide evidence for that in many different ways. Um, so uh, this is good because uh, uh, you can see that liquid crystal uh, colloids allow us to probe the interplay between the topology of surfaces, um, which we can control here by fabricating these particles, and also the topology of fields, such as uh, director fields and vector fields, um, uh, and so uh, uh, we can, for example, understand um, how 
the fact that um, the liquid crystal director field has nonpolar um, symmetry um, increases the diversity of different field configurations that can satisfy those topological constraints. And now we already know that from, for example, Mark Bovic's talk that um, uh, the topology uh, of uh, the nonpolar director field configurations and uh, defects we have in uh, liquid crystals is similar to that of cosmic strings, right? So, uh, so we can then generalize the conclusions we get in here studying liquid crystals to many other systems. So I think this is uh, uh, making the liquid crystal colloids quite a useful um, uh, experimental system that probes, that allows us to probe this uh, general, um, the general properties of the interplay um, between the topologies of surfaces, fields, and defects. Okay, so uh, here's a clicker question. I already asked it some time ago, but uh, I'll do it again. So if uh, somebody is battery dying, there are plenty of uh, clickers here, if you want to vote, uh, feel free to take some. Alright, so I'll stop the system uh, because we still need to go through a number of different things. Okay, so majority answer may uh, actually uh, you can see it, majority answered uh, uh, correctly, so uh, the, oops, uh, the um, A is correct, um, and so it was interesting, you probably all already noticed that <laughs> here in the student center we have uh, this, right, and so uh, perhaps Ladies could ask, uh, you know, uh, if they can do this. This I took from uh, the internet, but uh, uh, you can see that the, the topic of knots can be very uh, broad. Um, but uh, um, um, so the original. Um, I just want to mention it that uh, long before we knew about what the atoms really are, um, uh, Lord Kelvin had an idea that they could be uh, knotted vortices, right? And so this stimulated many uh, mathemat mathematicians at the time to work on this problem because they felt it might be really, really important. Uh, so what they wanted to do is to tabulate different types of knots that one can have and see if, if um, uh, you know, you would get periodic table of Mendeleev, right, just by uh, classifying the different number of crossings that you would have in, in different uh, types of knots. And so, uh, long before uh, scientists figured out what atoms really are, uh, mathematicians realize that, you know, those tables don't match. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but for some 20 or 30 years, uh, the uh, vortex uh, theory of atoms proposed by Lord Kelvin, Peter Kreif, and others at the time, was, uh, uh, you know, the, the key concept of what atoms could be. Interestingly enough, much, much later, um, the knot theory, which was originate, which originated at that time, but was later developed by mathematicians further and further, um, started to be used quite extensively by 
physicist again, and so, for example, Ed Wheaton was um, using it in developing many physics theories, but also he, by, by developing those theories, for example, in quantum field theory, he provided a lot of insights into where the properties of um, not, uh, you know, where certain concepts of not theory arise from, and so he is the only physicist to receive a Fields Medal, right, which is the highest honor for mathematicians who are not uh, receiving uh, Nobel Prizes, as you know. Right, so uh, it's interesting that uh, what originally was initiated by physicists you know, became such uh, a big part of topology and mathematical topological theories uh, and then became uh, again so useful uh, in understanding, for example, the physics of uh, elementary particles nowadays. Um, um, but um, uh, our question was whether it is possible to again use uh, colloidal particles that would have um, knotted um, um, you know, configurations uh, and uh, extend this ability of probing the interplay between uh, topology of fields, defects and surfaces uh, to knotted uh, configurations as well. And so uh, by means of this two photon polymerization that we discussed last time, uh, we can fabricate particles that have uh, the shapes of trifoil, pentafoil knots that you can see here. And so you can view them in SEM images uh, from different sides and uh, you can confirm that there are no connections between them. Uh, so they really have topology of you know, different um, knots depicted in here. Right? So those are views from the side and from the top. And um, uh, the question is, what types of topological defects we can generate by introducing those types of colloidal particles into liquid crystal. So, uh, uh, let us remind ourselves what is Euler characteristic of uh, a torus knot. Uh, so, both of those types of knots are called torus knots. Um, and so, uh, the notation uh, is um, such that uh, you know, the general notation is T of PQ, where uh, the, the knot winds Q times around, the, the knotted cube is winding Q times around the circle in the interior of a torus, and P times around its axis, right? So, uh, now, uh, but both of them are torus knots, so you can kind of wind them around the torus surface. Um, and so, in order to know what the other characteristic in topology we can cut if we later glue back, right? So, if we cut them here and then uh, uh, reconnect, uh, we realize that the other characteristic is that of a torus still. Um, and so, it's equal zero. Uh, what this means is that uh, if we induce surface defects on the surface of the torus knot uh, or knotted tube in our case they should have their winding numbers adding to zero again right? and so in here you can see such a particle in the crystal between cross polarizers without and with an additional phase recognition plane we can do three dimensional imaging of such particles so this is obtained in here with me, by means of three quantum excitation polarizing microscopy for polarization in this direction. Based on such images, we can then map director field configurations on the surface of the particles and also in the bulk. Um, and uh, we also do uh, three-dimensional uh, modeling of what we obtain by minimizing the um, the Landau de Chantry energy with additional surface entry terms. Um, and so in here you can see what happens for the particle, knotted particle uh, with tangential surface boundary conditions. 
we visualize the complex director field pattern by means of uh, this color uh, scheme that you can see here where different colors denote different azimuthal orientations of director in the plane of the surface of the particle, right? So the, the director wants to be tangential to the surface of the particle, but then it can adopt different orientations. And so you note those points at which different colors meet. Those points correspond to bosons that we use and that you can also see in the regular polarizing microscopy textures as those points where, you know, the bright bands around the particle are interacted. Um, and so uh, uh, we can now count the number of bosons. And so for this trefoil knot particle, we have three that you can see from the top, but there are also um, three uh, from the opposite side, and then three on the other vertices. Uh, uh, and so in total we have 12 bosons, uh, six of which are um, the plus ones, and six of which are minus ones. Uh, and so uh, um, the overall, uh, so we produced, as you will see from the examples I will demonstrate next, um, we produced particles with different um, P number in here uh, and Q number in here, and so we will see that the total number of bosons is typically uh, 4Q. Um, so uh, it, um, as we have such uh, torus particles um, in uh, uh, each place where, uh, uh, you know, the particle, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, is uh, bending um, we have uh, a series of two bosons on the opposite parts of the surface. So here is a, a T35 um, um, colloidal particle, and uh, you can see experimental images uh, that have, um, you know, jet fluorescence depicted in the pattern of field configurations, again depicted by color. So here Q is equal 5, and we have 20. 4Q, which is 20 uh, bosons in total, if we count, uh, looking at from different sides. And uh, again, uh, we have equal number of uh, opposite winding numbers of bosons, um, and they add to zero, uh, as we would expect. So now, in addition to tangential boundary conditions, we can also induce perpendicular anchoring on the particle surfaces, and this is done in here. Uh, for trefoil colloidal particle, and so what we observe is that um, a trefoil colloidal particle induces uh, two trefoil knots of defect, loop, defect loops. So you remember spherical particles could induce a ring-shaped disclination loop of half-integer disclination. Um, in here, when we have a knotted particle, uh, we induce two knotted um, disclinations, right, which are both trefoil knots. But what's more interesting is that those knotted defect loops that we induce are also linked with each other and with the particle itself. Um, and so you can understand the, the field configuration that we have in a relatively simple way if you just simply look at cross-section of the particle, right? So the particle surface induces perpendicular anchoring, and locally we need to have two half integer disconnections, right, running perpendicular to the tube in order to compensate uh, for the um, effective winding number of uh, uh, director field around the surface of particle in here. And so this is done with those two discrimination loops, which again have uh, the hedgehog charges self-compensating each other, right? So again, we satisfy uh, the topological theorems because there is uh, no net hedgehog charge induced by, by such a particle in the bulk of the crystal. And so in here you can see 
are three dimensional, uh, three photon excitation for writing across the particular sections, where you can see those defect lines um, uh, that um, you are visible in different intersections. So those are depths resolved, right, and only in the places where uh, the plane of the cross-section of images coincides with the location of those destinations, you see those darkish uh, lines right around the particle. So now we can complicate things a little bit further even, right, by um, introducing also linked particles, right? So now we generate colloidal particles which are Brownian micron-sized colloids that can, you know, undergo Brownian motion uh, in a dispersion with respect to each other, um, uh, but they are linked, right? So uh, we fabricate particles in the form of hot links, right? But um, um, uh, then introduce into liquid crystal. And so again, we can play with surface boundary conditions by controlling them to be tangential or perpendicular to the surface. Uh, and so here are experimental examples and also results of numerical modeling uh, for um, uh, the, the configurations that can occur. Um, and so there is one configuration when we have uh, four bosons only uh, on one side, and this ring is perpendicular to particle director, which can then be without uh, bosons. Um, and then the other one, when the two are uh, tilted with respect to the far field, and then we have uh, four bosons on each of the particles, so eight bosons in total. So overall, in principle, topologically, we are not required to have bosons in those cases, right? Because um, in, you remember that the particles are linked and have uh, um, 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 each ring has genus equal zero, but um, but you can you can see that the bosons appear for similar reasons we discussed before for um, you know the single ring particles. Uh, now, um, if we induce perpendicular surface boundary conditions, um, as in the examples that you can see here, um, we then have links not not only. The most common configuration is when we have links of not only the particles themselves, but also disconnection loops which follow uh, those ring-shaped particles, right? And so, um, we will see later that uh, a number of different configurations can occur. You could just have um, the rings on the, on the particle surface that just simply for, follow their respective colloids, or you could have also disconnection rings that jump from one particle surface to the other particle surface. And so, in here you can see experimental polarizing microscopy images um, corresponding to this case. Um, and so here you can see yet another configuration where, um, you know, the defects um, uh, you know, on the surface of particle are jumping from one to the other. And so we can have, for example, um, ring-shaped particles linked with each other but inducing uh, disconnections that are forming knots, all links, and so topology becomes very interesting. And um, again, a large diversity of structures that can occur. Um, so the uh, the hop link was the simplest type of links that you can fabricate, but um, so uh, you can also generate uh, link particles with higher linking number. Uh, and so the next example is uh, the Solomon link, which you can, in the simplest way, represent, um, you know, as uh, I depicted here, but. Keep in mind that this is three-dimensional complex particle because you need to go go up and down in order to um, you know cross those different uh, particle surfaces without touching each other. And so in here you can see experimental images of uh, such particles. You know when we observe them 
without polarizers. It's a planar cell with focal directors in this direction. And uh, you can see that um, the field configuration is fairly complex. It's very hard to understand what's going on if you just look at polarizing across the textures. Um, but uh, we can do cross-section, uh, uh, you know, three-dimensional imaging with uh, uh, some diffraction uh, spatial resolution when we use uh, nonlinear uh, processes such as important absorption. And so we can then map the director field. Uh, so in here again, you can see um, as uh, the overlay images. Um, obtained for two excitation polarizations of excitation light that are then colored with respect to colors and um, you know overlaid on top of each other and um, um, those allow us to visualize the complex field configurations which we then can compare also with results of numerical modeling. Right. So again, uh, the simplest configuration in here is when the tube of the particle that forms this Solomon link is simply followed by a pair of half-integer disconnections which are also forming Solomon links, right? But then, just like in the case of Hopp links, we can have a large number of other configurations that are possible too that satisfy topological constraints but are more complicated. So, um, uh, this is what I wanted to discuss for the case of uh, colloidal inclusions in liquid crystals uh, and uh, then uh, uh, it took more time than I expected uh, and uh, the, the last part of my talk was supposed to be devoted to uh, the confinement of liquid crystals into uh, topological and non-trivial confinement geometries um, so I will maybe just go through it very briefly um, and uh, since we don't have that much time left. Right, so uh, in the previous examples we were um, introducing colloids with complicated uh, surface topology into liquid crystals but we can also confine liquid crystals into, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, polymer confinement or some other confinement geometries uh, where um, we can control topology of surfaces such as all the other characteristic of surfaces of the droplets that we obtain in this way. So here for example you have uh, um, the uh, torus shaped um, <coughs> droplet that we uh, fabricate in a polymer matrix, right? And so uh, uh, previously similar um, types of droplets have been obtained, freestanding droplets as well. Um, but uh, what I will want to demonstrate to you um, is that we can also obtain such droplets in polymer confinement geometry. And so as we do, um, uh, you remember that here uh, on the characteristic chi is equal to zero, so the minimum energy configuration that occurs uh, is just when we have uh, the uh, <coughs> concentric uh, director fields parallel to uh, the torus surface um, as depicted in here, and uh, for genus one uh, surface there are no defects required um, and so um, uh, we satisfy topological constraints. But what is interesting is that when we go to uh, genus G equal 2 surface, um, then uh, we of course are expecting to have topological defects. And for large droplets, um, which were obtained in the past um, by Fernando, uh, uh, by uh, Alberto Fernandez Nieves at Georgia Tech, um, they observed bujums. Um, what I want to demonstrate in here is that we can satisfy those constraints dictated by topological theorems also in a very different way that would not be possible to do for 
uh, the systems with vector fields, right? It's only possible for liquid crystals, where we have non-polar symmetry. So instead of having bosons, which we can also observe for large droplets, when the confinement is, you know, on the scale of tens of microns and larger, uh, for smaller droplets we observe discrimination lines which run across the entire thickness of such uh, droplet in a polymer matrix. Right? And so, uh, uh, in here you can see we have two discriminations. Um, we can assure and guarantee that those are not bulges, but discriminations running across the entire cell, uh, uh, droplet thickness by mapping the director field on the surface of such a droplet in a polymer matrix, right? So the boundary conditions are tangential, and uh, we know that in here, um, in those two locations, the discriminations are running across the entire droplet thickness. We obtain the same result also by minimizing the uh, landau de free energy with additional surface anchoring terms. Um, and so, uh, now, is this surprising? <coughs> Well, yes and no. So, in principle, we realize that a bujum is topologically equivalent to a discrimination line, right? Because uh, uh, you can see that even the internal structure of a bujum, um, as we already discussed in, in some of our previous works, um, is uh, that of uh, half integer semi ring. Right, um, um, but uh, typically this structure is of the order of uh, pneumatic coherence length, so on the order of 10 nanometers or so. But in the case of other particles, we can have uh, the sizes of the order of micrometers, right? So uh, uh, it is interesting that uh, uh, the elastic free energy, overall free energy uh, of the structures with discrimination lines running across the thickness of the droplet is smaller than that uh, of having bosons uh, which are topologically equivalent to each other. Right? So uh, uh, now if we were to increase the size of droplets further, going from uh, micrometers to millimeters, so hundreds of micrometers, uh, then uh, just like in the case of uh, Alberto Fernandez Nieves, we would observe on the point defects because in larger sample sizes, those become of lower energy. All right, so uh, we can see such defect lines, and again, uh, we can satisfy the topological constraints, right, uh, by uh, on the at the interface of liquid crystal and polymer matrix around it. Um, by having uh, the uh, surface defects not only of integer type, like in the case of bosons, but also half integer types, right? So uh, they still add to color. Uh, and uh, uh, also the bulk uh, match of charge is satisfying topological series. And so here you can see examples of um, such droplets, both in experiments and in simulations. We occasionally get pairs of self-compensating defect lines like the one depicted in here um, and uh, um, uh, so overall you can have more defects in metastable and stable ground states than needed as long as um, you know you have local minimum of local minimum of the energy so here is a genus G equals 3 surface, you know, the same conclusions hold in here. We can have defect lines, also G equals 4 and 5 surfaces. And so in all of those cases, um, yeah, for micron-sized droplets, we satisfy uh, the topological constraints through introducing bulk defect lines rather than surface bosons, uh, which is quite interesting because uh, it wouldn't be possible to do if we had a uh, vector field rather than director field um, where the half integer defect lines are not allowed. 
And so you can see that um, the nonpolar nature of liquid crystals increases the diversity of possibilities um, of satisfying topological constraints. So um, um, another um, boundary condition time that we can have is perpendicular surface anchoring. And so uh, we are familiar with many past works done for capillaries where uh, one can obtain uh, uh, such perpendicular boundary conditions. And it was demonstrated that depending on the size of the capillaries, one can have the so-called escape of defect lines in here um, and other different structures that can form. Um, so we can also have perpendicular boundary conditions when we confine liquid crystal droplets in polymer matrix and treat the polymer surfaces of that droplet for perpendicular anchoring. And here you see polarizing across the texture of such um, uh, you know, escape configuration where we have no defects consistent with the uh, Euler characteristic of such a surface being zero and escape configuration, right? But then if you go from genus equal one to genus two surface, of course defects are acquired and they are observed in our experiments and uh, more than one configuration can occur, but I just show you one example in here where we have um, a point defect or small defect loop in this location and this is consistent with uh, uh, the fact that chi is equal uh, 2 in this case so the charge of the defect that we induce is 1 and uh, as I mentioned already it's in fact a tiny loop um, however um, just like in the case of capillaries here when we have uh, confinement of liquid crystal into such droplets, uh, we have a strong dependence of the behavior on the size mm -hmm. of the uh, cross-section of such a droplet. Right, so um, uh, when we have uh, uh, the radius equal 2.5 micrometers, uh, we can uh, observe not escaped uh, configuration, but that with two half integer discriminations. Um, and those can form separate rings or they can also form uh, knotted uh, configurations. Um, I will not have a chance to discuss those. Uh, but, um, um, uh, you know, a, a very diverse, um, you know, uh, um, um, type of uh, uh, large number of diverse configurations can occur. So, um, in here, um, you can see one example. Um, so as we go to larger um, genus surfaces, um, again we can see point defects and uh, also distillation loops depending on whether the size is large enough for escape or it's smaller so that we have uh, uh, singular distillation loops occur. So here the point defects can be observed and also obtained by means of numerical modeling um, <coughs> for larger droplet sizes. Um, so uh, um, um, I uh, rushed a little bit through this because we are running out of time, but the key point is that um, there are many different ways of satisfying topological constraints, especially in liquid crystals when we have non-polar symmetry and therefore we are allowed to have defect lines um, that can form all kinds of loops with different hedgehog charges, right? And so uh, uh, the constraint is that you add to Euler characteristic or Euler characteristic over 2 for surface and valve defects respectively, but you can do it in many different ways, right? And so I would like to conclude for the entire series of the lectures that I gave. Um, so uh, in addition to giving you the overview of different experimental techniques that allow us exploration of um, uh, topology of defect surfaces and fields in liquid crystals, 
we saw that uh, in liquid crystals we can generate textures, right? Um, you remember this is a separate class of defects uh, and I, I think Mark Bovic will discuss them in more details later on during the lecture, during the uh, summer school one more time. Um, uh, so uh, it is important that we have this type of defects in liquid crystals because they haven't been observed before in, in liquid crystal media. Um, then uh, it is possible to have um, uh, self-assembly and patterning of topological defects including torrents, hopians, uh, coin defects and different types of uh, discriminations. This is slightly contrary to you because those defects don't annihilate in those examples we demonstrated especially when we have them generated in uh, frustrated cholesteric liquid crystals they can be stable long time and even form um, you know long term stable crystal and quasi crystal arrays um, and, and the reason this is the case is um, because we can use twisted configurations to stabilize them um, and uh, uh, so I also demonstrated that arrays uh, so not only we can use uh, uh, phase singularities and laser beams of light or optical vortices to control the structure of defects in liquid crystals but also arrays of defects in liquid crystals can be used to control the phase singularities and laser beams of light um, and uh, by demonstrating uh, by demonstrating the examples of um, the uh, colloids of different types, I showed that um, the liquid crystals can be used as a test ground for probing, um, you know, some of the concepts of mathematical and physical theories related to uh, topological interplay of topologies of surfaces, fields, and defects. Because it's a fairly accessible system, as we understand it, can be experimental problem. Um, finally, uh, through some of the examples I demonstrated to you, you can probably conclude that uh, topology can be used as a recipe book for self-assembly, right? Like, for example, in the case of torrents uh, that could be, uh, you know, self-assembly in liquid, uh, uh, confined cholesteric liquid crystals, where by applying different voltages we could control into what types of configurations they assemble uh, and the same can be also extended to all different types of colloids that we have discussed um, so by keeping in mind the topological relations between charges of defects and you know the topology of surfaces of colloidal inclusions um, those relations can be used to, you know, um, um, to design um, the composite materials based on self-assembly. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan, for a fantastic series of lectures. Um, not only is Ivan a fantastic experimentalist, um, but he's also the person who's uh, been responsible for pulling everything together uh, for this, this workshop. So since he, he needs to leave today, I think we should give him an extra bit of thanks. <laughs>